Hello and welcome to Counterculture. I am Peter Whittle. Now you might remember a few weeks ago there was a story in the press about how men should maybe stop talking about sport at work because this alienated and excluded their female colleagues. <laughs> These stories now come pretty thick and fast. Last year we had the American Psychology Institute talking about how masculinity, traditional masculinity, was quote harmful. And a year ago, pretty much to the month, we had that now infamous Gillette commercial, mm. which really pretty much showed all men behaving badly. It seems now that when we have the word masculinity in a sentence, it's always preceded by toxic. So it would appear there is an attack on men. If that is the case, how the hell is it going to pan out in the end? Now, we're going to be talking about all these issues today with four great guests. First of all, we have Blinda Brown, who is a journalist, writes for the Daily Mail and for the conservative woman on issues such as feminism and men's issues. Martin Dobney, who is co-founder of the Men and Boys Coalition. He was also editor for a long time of Loaded magazine and more recently has become well known in another area as a candidate for the Brexit Party at the general election. We have Dr. John Barry, psychologist and also honorary lecturer at the University College in London. He is also co-founder of the Men's Psychology Network. And finally, we have the resident guest, New Culture Forum's commentator and historian, Rafe hadelman Koo. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming and talking about this. Um, I want to start by asking any of you, when did you first hear the term toxic masculinity? Probably quite a long time ago, because I've been researching this for, for, for a long while. I mean, if I, if I the, the way I would understand it is um, feminism um, has, you know, it's assumed that women have been oppressed since the beginning of time. I mean, that's the whole sort of subtext of feminism. You know, why is it that um, women have been unequal in the workplace? And their explanation is men have been oppressing us. So if that's your baseline, you've got to say that um, there's something at fault with men that they've been oppressing us. I mean, the point is that, of course, that's not true at all. Mm. And we haven't been oppressed. We're just different. And uh, we've given birth. And there's a completely different way of understanding the different positions of men and women in society. But I think the whole idea of toxic masculinity is kind of inherent within feminism. That's my view. It's actually inherent. So basically, yes. it wasn't just a case of, in your view, of equality and pay equality. It was that basically men are, are, are beasts. That, that's right. I mean, I, 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 well, I, I've, I, I, studied, I studied social anthropology. I mean, right from the feminism is not just about equality. I think that's a bit of a myth. It's got a whole, you just need to read all the texts from the 60s onwards. It's talking about patriarchy and... Um, the oppression of women. I mean, that's and, and and you've got to find a way of explaining that. So the assumption is that that men, men have been these sort of oppressive beasts who've been trying to oppress us since the beginning of time. And that, for me, is why I'm personally um, slightly antagonistic towards feminism because I feel it's created this really serious misunderstanding between men and women. I think it's. A, it's tragic. I don't think tragic is too strong a word at portraying men as being toxic. Quite honestly, I think men are, are women's greatest allies. Um, and um, yeah, so, hmm. so that, I mean, that's, that's my beef with feminism. When you, when you hear this term, you know, traditional masculinity is harmful. I mean, what's your, what's your reaction to, to that, Martin? It's absolute cobblers. And it's scientifically unfounded. Let's look at the, the, the sector of society who have willingly sacrificed their own lives, taken the most dangerous jobs, protected, mm. nurtured, created safe environments for women, their families. It's traditional men. You know, my dad was a coal miner. You know, he either worked or slept. Why is that toxic? Mm -hmm. Why is that patriarchal? Why is that controlling? Uh, that generation saw that as their duty. And I think we've lost a great deal of the good parts of that. Uh, in the wash. The phrase toxic masculinity first, I think, broke cover around about 2013-ish. And at first, a great many of us in, who work in the area of men's issues sort of laughed. We thought it was a joke. But it was like one of those canaries down the mine of the end of sense, really. It was, it was one of those pioneer phrases 
um, of the, the pathologizing of being a man that could only be deemed as a negative trait. It, it was seen through the prism of, of oppression and negativity. And at first it was funny, there had been a great war on lad culture. When I was at Loaded Magazine, we were seen as the pioneers of uncouth, misogynistic, sexist, as if... But you every- were, weren't you? Well, but, it was, but that in itself, well, in a sense, yes, because it was, nothing happens in a vacuum culturally, does it? Because we were living through the era of we must all be new men, we must all wear papooses and do the housework, and a great many men thought sod that. Mm. Or some wanted to do it, but not everybody. Mm. And I think the trouble with all of these phrases was there's very much a feeling this infiltrated academia, it infiltrated the media, it infiltrated politics, and soon this, this nonsensical fabrication became the truth. Mm. Worse, it became the backbone of policy, or more to the point, it became the reason to avoid helping men in terms of policy applications because we were, we were taught that men can only possibly be privileged. Mm. When does white male privilege kick in for boys at the bottom of education, for example? When, is, when does male privilege kick in for the 85% of the homeless community, for the 95% of the jail community? It's cobblers. Mm. This is a point, actually, you mentioned there, white, white ma- men. I mean, when we're talking about the attack on masculinity, if we, if we accept, do we all accept there is one? Or, I mean, do you? I mean, you're looking at this from a different, you're a psychologist, you're obviously, mm. so what, you're looking at it from a different angle. Uh, well, I, I'm also exposed to the same media as everybody else mm. uh, kind of in mm. popular culture. Um, I think it's hard to ignore the fact that, that there is an attack on, on men and masculinity. And I think it's, you know, toxic masculinity is, is just a symptom of that. And uh, Belinda's right. I mean, there are aspects of feminism that have uh, fed into this. The, the part of feminism I think most people will agree on it, uh, that is absolutely fine is the equality part and the equality of opportunity. Yeah. Mm. There is the though this, this uh, other aspect to it that, that's kind of uh, latched on about patriarchy and, and this this cast men as being the oppressors of, of women uh, and men are said to, to have some sort of innate need uh, due to the patriarchy and, and due to masculinity uh, to, to oppress women, be violent against them, uh, be homophobic uh, and, uh, and it just, it, it, you'd kind of wonder where this idea grew from For, as Martin says, I mean like men have been doing the dirty, dangerous jobs. Uh, 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 they're the, the, the homeless, they're the, the main population in prisons. And, uh, and no doubt men aren't angels or anything like that, but to, to say that, that all this, that the, the sacrifice that the kind of provider role, the protector role that men have uh, done throughout, you know, forever, uh, just leaves them with nothing except being uh, cast as toxic people. I mean, this seems to be uh, an attack on men and undeserved. Well, this, put, yes, the big Lie, the big lie of the patriarchy oppressing oppressing women ignores the fact that yes whilst it's true that those at the top of the totem pole are men the vast majority of men aren't at the top of the totem yeah. pole and they're being equally as oppressed as women are if you're going to believe that this is all about power structures it's simply a hierarchy that exists as exists in nature and has done for the thousands of years between all species um, the insidious element of, of all of this I think is, is to accept reality and accept facts of what this crisis of masculinity is doing two thirds three quarters of all the suicides Mm. in this country are by men. You are more likely to die from suicide if you're cause of death under the age of 49. Suicide oh, yeah, is the leading yeah. cause of death. Mm-hmm. We're going through an epidemic here of kids dropping out of school, dropping out of university. It's white working class men who yeah. feel are the most disadvantaged group in society and there's no outreach being made towards them on, in any level. Mm-hmm. And so I think this idea of, of toxic masculinity doesn't exist. There's toxic feminism and it's tox- toxic feminists who have a, a problem with personality disorder where they can't can't actually distinguish between uh, males who are powerful and abusive and those who are who have powerful, powerful competencies to, to actually elevate society with their inability to distinguish between those who are the problem. Yeah, but that's the curse of identity <coughs> politics right there, in a nutshell. Absolutely. If you treat an entire demographic as uniform, then you are not only dunderheaded, you are doing a great disservice to those at the bottom who are being made to, pun- being made to pay because of those at the top. And that is why The men and boys at the bottom just don't get any policy help. There's no outreach help. It's a very unfashionable cause. I've been trying for years over the road in Westminster to get these things going. That's why I stood, you know, at the general election. I would have been championing this work in Westminster if I could. And I'm really hoping that there is optimism 
we have a new wave of blue-collar conservatives, because mm. it's been the conservatives that seem to have cared. These are traditional Labour heartlands that Labour's completely abandoned mm. on, on the altar of identity politics, because they don't fit the script. But can I, can I, can I just, uh, you just talked about, you know, uh, traditional working class communities that have come over to Boris's time and whatever. Um, isn't this something which is not to do with feminism, in that basically men doing traditional jobs like your father did, like mine did actually, mm. um, Basically, those jobs are no longer yeah. there. That there's, is a problem. Those jobs are no longer there. So basically, that's not feminist fault, is it? Well, that, I mean, a couple of things. It, it is sli ever so slightly feminist fault because I think that if, if <laughs> well, you... Well, wait a minute, what? Because the, the mines were closed. No, I, I think that we, mm. we could have... I mean, just if, if for the sake of argument, we could have actually perhaps made a lot more effort or Thatcher could have actually made a lot more effort to get work going for men, but she knew that she had a service economy she could fill with women and women, you know, she'd keep the feminists happy because she'd be providing women with loads of work in the service economy so maybe she didn't make quite as much effort as she should have done for men so I can always find a way of blaming feminists I must admit but <laughs> that, um, that does seem very circuitous yes, it is I very circuitous mm. I agree it's very circuitous but I think that there uh, there is there is a something to take into consideration if you want to understand why perhaps some issues with masculinity have arisen when they have and that is that it is unarguable that feminists they, they really, uh, and I can give quotes, I've written about it, they really didn't think the father was necessary in the family. And if you go back mm -hmm. at looking at policies, you can see a whole series of policies which worked to support the single parent family and encourage mm -hmm. the single parent family. And I think we've now got about 43% of the population brought up in, in single mother homes. So what you have is, 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 is boys who haven't had a father in their lives. And I think mm -hmm. this is the source. I don't want to call it toxic masculinity, but if you don't, it is the man who models masculinity. A mother can't teach you how it's to absolutely. be a man. And, is and that is the source of problems with masculinity. And this is the absolute lie about the American Psychological Association yes. putting out this yes. terrible finding, which basically is a social justice you know, promotion poster saying that masculinity is a social danger <laughs> and is a harm, when actually what they're talking about is fatherless families, yeah. exactly. where the man is absent. So we're actually absent absent the masculine yes, figure, yeah. exactly. that's when you have the highest incidence of delinquency, antisocial yeah. behaviour and criminality. It's the lack of a masculine figure there. Exactly. It's uh, basically, it's not, it's actually, you know, masculinity and, and, is the solution. And actually, yes, exactly. and actually, you can make a sound and robust scientific case for precisely that. If you look at fatherlessness and what it precipitates in terms of criminality, justice system, lack of educational opportunities, the absence of positive masculinity, a role model that keeps you on the straight and narrow, two parents you know, helping better than one, not just because of their genders, but because two, two parents are just better than one in terms of academic output, results, teenage pregnancies, proponency to, to experiment with drugs and alcohol. There's evidence is, is, is out there, it's a huge amount of evidence, which disproves toxic mas masculinity at the drop of a hat, yet it's been allowed to take hold. And you've done a great amount of work on this, John, where you and I have worked together when you look at positive masculinity and what makes men actually fulfilled, I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, I mean, this this attack on, on patriarchy, I think sometimes just translates into an attack on uh, households that are led by men, that, that have got men as the main uh, breadwinner. I think men have been quite marginalised, and and the results are. I mean, everybody's right here. Um, you know, the, the 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 research has been done. The results are in. Um, a, f a good father is absolutely, uh, you know, is solid gold for for the development of boys, and uh, and their behaviour. And remove the dad, um, th th trouble can start. And of course, a bad dad is 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 no good really either. They they have to, to sort themselves out. But a good dad is uh, and p uh, modelling positive positive masculinity is. Is what uh, it creates then good men who don't go around doing the, the things that, that yeah. men are being uh, accused of. Like you, you got a few uh, offenders, and and then they, they get generalised as what men are like yeah. uh, typically. Mm. And uh, and the, another aspect of this is too that that some of the very worst uh, 
uh, and I don't want to use the word toxic, especially in this case, but like some of the, the worst offenders, um, uh, uh, psychopathic sex offenders or, or personality disorder sex offenders, do have in their histories um, some serious trauma. And this this is the, the missing ingredient to, to the, yeah. the worst sort of behavior that we see from men, is um, trauma, especially early childhood yeah. trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes th this can be done at the hands of a female caregiver or mm. supposed caregiver. So this is, so some of the roots of the worst toxic masculinity, um, you know, we, we have to, to really look at some of the, the mothering that happens too. Well, the thing is, is yeah, but you, if you go back to your first point, actually, it's interesting. If you look at like knife crime in London, yeah. we have endless, I'm on the London Assembly, we have endless debates about this. But the one thing that people won't on the whole talk about is the lack of fathers yeah. often. It's interesting, yeah. in, in, in the Lamy report into knife yes. crime, which, which actually was a really solid piece of, of work, uh, it was touched upon. You know, the evidence of fatherlessness and the, the propensity to, to offend in the absence of a father is, is absolutely crystal clear. And this is globally, you know, not just in L London knife crime, but anywhere in the world it has a result. But it was kind of brushed under the carpet, especially by the, the liberal media. It just doesn't, doesn't fit the scripts, because let's face it, at the heart of patriarchy theory, at the heart of toxic masculinity theory, is a war on the traditional nuclear conservative yeah. family. This is the crucial Simple. point, it seems to me, this is the point, is that when you say about feminism, you know, being to blame, it seems to me there are two things here. There's feminism, and then there's also what you might call the woke cultural Marxist bit, mm. Mm. which is not the same thing, not quite the same thing. No. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Because, I mean, we've been talking, sorry, we've been talking, for example, particularly, um, about, on the whole, an attack on white straight males. Wouldn't, I would recognise it as that, wouldn't you? Exactly. Well, and it's an attack on the nuclear family as a whole. And it's the idea now that all families are equal. Well, I'm sorry, all families are not equal. Um, the, the evidence is quite clear. Two parent families mm. are infinitely better than one parent families for all sorts of reasons. Assuming those are two decent parents, obviously, you have to assume mm. that there's a love, and, a love and care there in terms of the, the way that they're raised. But um, certainly, I think all of this comes down really to the, to the idea that think of today's young man living in East London who hasn't got a father figure. He's told throughout his education system that's his part his toxic masculinity yeah. Yeah. that they're liable to rape and pillage and violence and aggression and the oppression of women there's no more competitive sports to engage in or any of that team building that used to happen where you challenge each other everyone's got to be a winner what hope does that person have now there's no outlet for him to actually develop his masculinity and that's why they're dropping out because they feel themselves as failures they feel that they've got some sort of you know like you know, Christian guilt almost mm. yeah. born into sin mm. yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting because you know should any of this matter you because you know, the, the response to that well, cry me a river. You know, men rule the world, mm. Mm. men captain industry, mm. men are most mm. likely to be politicians, but that's not all men. Mm. You know, mm. what I see, I do a lot of talks in schools, I'm kind of on the front line with teenagers in Britain, and all this stuff has an effect. You know, when you, when you grow up, and from the age of five or six, you, you are told that girls can do anything they want, which by the way is brilliant. I've got a daughter and a son, I want both of them to, to have every opportunity, but you're also yeah. told, yeah. Men have this intrinsic, suspicious, creepy so propensity. When say, but, but Martin, when you say well, you're also told this, who is telling? Teachers. And, and who taught them? I don't blame the teachers. I blame who taught them. And who taught them? And, and this, I, I think, you work in academia. I think academia is rotten. It's, 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 so in, ter in terms of yeah. the mindset, yeah. the prevailing wind of yeah. masculinity, I mean, where yeah. are the it's, conservative professors? Where are... Yeah. You know, the professors agree with masculinity being a good thing. Yeah. You're a rare breed, John. Yeah, um, yeah. thanks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's not entirely rotten, but I mean, the social sciences do kind of lean, lean towards the whole woke end of, of the mm. spectrum, unfortunately. And there's a lot of, of uh, baggage that goes along with that. And, and included in that is, is a lot of, of a kind of sociological fluffy theory about patriarchy and, and, uh, and about other social influences that may or may not exist. I mean, one social influence, influence I'd like to see some proper research on is the influence of uh, boys growing up in a culture that tells them that there's something wrong with them because they're, they're boys. There, there, there's enough research out there to, to tell us that we should be extremely concerned about that and we don't even know exactly what the result's going to be. I mean people who are told these negative things about them, they might, they might just suffer from low self-esteem or they might become depressed or they might reject it or they might take it on board and say okay I'm toxic, I'll just show you exactly yeah, I'll yeah, be the most yeah, toxic yeah, yeah. bloke you've ever seen. So I think we have to be really kind of careful that we're not by doing, the, by kind of 
tried to tell boys that they, they, they shouldn't rape girls and things like this, so that we're not actually causing more harm and, and mm. causing more of the problems mm. that we're trying to get, to, to get yeah. rid of. But the, mm. This all started in the 60s when you had essentially the move to create these Mickey Mouse courses of gender studies and women's studies and people looked around and they got females, there were, there were very few female faculty at the time, they tended to be in departments of, of English, so there are people from the Department of English founding women's studies and gender studies. No biologists were brought along, they didn't want to have any biological components, nobody yeah. with any scientific background was brought in and you began to get theories yeah. with very poor peer review yeah. and you saw that recently when, when uh, two or three, Bogosian and two, and two others, fabricated all this information yeah. And, yeah. Got, and got these laughable <laughs> yeah. papers published yeah. and uh, people were touting them until they were exposed as being completely fraud, fraudulent because mm. there's no peer review, there's no analysis mm -hmm. and th this is now constantly cited as by, by the BBC and others, oh well the evidence state states even though this evidence is all bunkum. So would, you, uh, would, you, would, you, would it be fair to say that you would all agree that, for example, the gender pay gap is fictitious? Yes. Well, yes. well th th they're, all, they're all differences in, in how men and women get paid. But often, if you choose a gender studies degree, as opposed to a mathematics de or computing degree, you might have a different career output. Mm. So actually, it's, it's a choice. And then later on, lifestyle choice, more like to, 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 to be mothers and stay-at-home parents. Yeah, women, uh, women make different choices, and that results. I mean, we're, we're paid the same for the same work on the whole, mm. um, but women make different choices. We have different priorities. We like to, be ne we like to um, work nearer to home. We prefer to have more time with our families. I mean, that's all proven in evidence. Women would like to spend a bit more time with their children, and that takes exactly. a knock on our, you know, why, why, why is what we get paid the most important thing? I don't see why this is held up as a th the, the main measure, because some of us value quality of life more and how much time we can spend with our families. I think that's more important than how much we get paid. So yeah, I think the, 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 the pay gap thing is, it's another of those things just to um, sort of keep feminism going and keep women getting worked up with men and unfairness and, and all the rest of it. Um, to basically, you know, to understand the gender pay gap, you have to do a multivariate analysis, yes. which is yes. too, too complicated to go into here. But I put it most succinctly by saying there isn't a gender pay gap, there's a mother's pay gap. Yeah. 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 If you understand yeah. that it's childbirth that actually yeah, is the right. factor, yeah. and look at it that way, there's a mother's pay gap and it's your and choice to, ha to have children or not. And, and mm. I totally agree. And a great way of addressing that would be more equality for men, which sounds oxymoronic, mm. but look at Sweden. Mm -hmm. you know, where, and Finland this week. Finland have introduced equal paternity pay as opposed to maternity pay. So men have the choice if they want to be primary carers so their wives can return to work. Then we see more equality, but still not full equality, because guess what? Choice is stubborn. Mm. Biology is stubborn. Even in Sweden, Norway, mm. all of those where they have the most equality on the planet, women still choose women's jobs, they still choose to be primary carers more than most. And it was the feminist groups in Sweden that yeah. kicked back against total equality because it's, it became the mother's right to mother, but biological. This, isn't this the point actually, though, Martin, as well, that you, you mentioned Scandinavian countries that this is an, uh, on the whole, this is a Western phenomenon, isn't mm. it? I mean, you, the, you, if you go anywhere else in the world, you're not going to get the attack on men the same way that you'll have in, say, like America, in Britain, in the mm. Anglosphere, in Western Europe, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Well, the academics are very yeah. quiet yeah. On, 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 on this kind of thing in, in places like Africa, aren't they? Right, yes. Because they're, they're in all sorts of hot water then. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. We have to make it about white Western men because we're the softest target. I have to say at this point, though, there'll be many women watching, I don't know, poss possibly some of your colleagues, and they will say, look, what are they going on about? You know, look, mm -hmm. women have had it like this for ages. Yeah. Then suddenly you get challenged and you're all getting upset about it. Does well, that, I mean, do, 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 can you not see that view? Well, I would say two wrongs don't make a right. For right. example, we are in undoubtedly about to see a flip of the gender pay gap yeah. because this week, it came out that for 30 straight years, white working class boys have been the bottom of education again. Mm. They're the least likely demographic to go to university. They are therefore going to be earning less in the next generation. And will anybody care then? So, so the downtrodding men at the expense of women going up, surely we should all be rising together. That's true yeah. equality. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. replacing one well-educated elite with another mm. who happen to have different things in their trousers or their skirts to me is, is missing the point. Mm. What about the quality of helping people from the working classes? Mm. How many working class people work at the BBC? Mm. How many people from council estates mm. or politicians? Mm. It's mm. not just it's an oversimplification to make it about gender. Mm. It's actually about background and helping everybody and be colour blind, be gender blind, just be helping those who need it. And it, right now, those people are white working class boys. But 
the, the gender politicians are blinded to this. Mm. It's short circuits, everything they've been told for 50 years. Have you, what, what are the kind of other sort of psychological problems that you think men face now, actually, John? Uh, well, uh, I mean... It's this kind of drip, drip, drip thing that they get of, of kind of, you know, somehow hostility or contradiction? We just don't know what, what the effect is. No one's really that interested in researching this. It's, it's another one of those things that, that we tend to be mm. blind to as a culture. Um, I'm guessing that it, it feeds into all sorts of problems and, and probably quite long-term problems. But we're, we're you know, we, we do need more research into this. We, we, we have a, make assumptions about men and masculinity. Like, for example, the APA uh, have decided that, that uh, masculinity is, is pure a product of, of culture it's nothing to do with biology so the testosterone that, that men have increasing muscle mass or energy or anything like that which is not brain development yeah, yeah. so uh, we, we need to and this is the APA I mean these the APA should be leading the, um, uh, the science of psychology throughout the world and they're not they've just completely they've just I, I don't know they've put a big banana skin in academia and everyone's slipping on it I mean in the in the UK we have uh, people who are falling in line with this flawed notion and the problem is you're going to have what, whether men's mental health issues are created by uh, a toxic culture that, that we might be living in um, we're going to have um, uh, therapists who are not equipped to help these men yeah. their idea of helping men is going to be saying well okay so you're you lost your job yeah. and now you're very depressed well you know that uh, you need to get over your patriarchal tendencies I mean that that's mm -hmm. not going to help anybody no. that's uh, and the whole idea of, of saying that uh, that somebody's a gender identity it, it, um, is bad. There's something dysfunctional about it. I thought we'd gone over that. I thought that mm. that was banned in, in lots of countries. Uh, you know, uh, with this conversion therapy, like it used to be a, a, a popular thing where if someone was gay, they were unhappy about being gay, they would experience uh, something called conversion therapy that would help them mm. in inverted commas with that. Uh, and now we seem to have that for masculinity. Mm. I, yeah, I, I, there's the, something yeah, deeply yeah. wrong yeah. about that. That's true. And the prevailing view now is you have the benevolent mother and the tyrannical father yeah. figure and that's always the way that you see it taught in, in school settings now there's this mm. implication behind that so there, so there needs to be for the good of the mental health of the next generation there needs to be an un unapologetic celebration of traditional masculinity which brought mm. us the industrial revolution which brought us capitalism both British creations too I might say <laughs> and it, it helped to advance you, science <laughs> and medicine and it basically progress human society to where it is it was the engineers going out it was exploring and discovering new flora and fauna to give us cures. That's the traditional masculinity we should be focusing on. If there is, if there is an attack on masculinity, if there's an attack on men, uh, if there's a war going on against men, what would victory look like then? I think getting, getting fathers, fathers um, back in families, you know, I no, think no. just... What is the victory that is hoped for? If I'm men are okay. under attack? I would say mm -hmm. th the first thing um, what we've been trying for for years at the Men and Boys Coalition is to get a cross-party action group on education. Mm. Let's actually look at why these boys are behind and let's listen, let's get inside. Like my mother used to be a family liaison officer. They, they all got swept away. Spend time in families. Now we can learn a great deal of positive stuff from other cultures in the UK. Chinese children, Asian children, or high achievers because they have that drive from their parents which is absent in a lot of the white working class communities because they had a bad educational experience themselves, all the mines have closed, all the steelworks have closed, all the shipyards have closed. What is the throughput for their masculinity? What's the point? Mm. The jobs aren't there. So if we actually listen and try and replace those industries with something new, we were with an organization called Lads Need Dads, and they actually sort of pair up boys who are going through a tough time, you know, mm. often going off the rails, they pair them up with the male mentor transforming lives. It's beautiful. And that's the point. You know, positive male role models in these young men's lives is a joyous thing to watch. And it can be a everybody wins if these kids stay out of jail. Everybody wins if they become good partners and tender, loving, beautiful boys. Everybody wins in society if we help these boys. This is not a competition. But I think you see we are we would agree with that. And we would you know we would want to be victorious. I really what I meant was the people who are waging the war the people who are attacking, what does victory look like to them? What is their aim? An inversion. I think they want to see, yeah. they want to see women is in charge. Seriously, is, is, that, is that what you think it is? 
Yeah, I would think so. I, I, yeah. I think that they'd like to see. I, I think they'd like to see the family, the, the family fragmented. I think they'd like to see um, sort of women in charge. I think. I think there's there's an aim. It seems to me as if there's just a really strong desire to break down the whole. I, I mean, I don't. What, you know, the ho whole sort of traditional family life that we've had since the beginning of time. In a way, you know, this has evolved over centuries, and I think that they have a a vision of this brave new society which they want to impose on the rest of the world. They want to change everything because this is this is empowering for them. I think they've got a sort of particular vision of a completely different society and that's what they're trying to bring about and the destruction of, of patriarchy, the destruction of Christianity, the destruction oh, of look, everything yeah, yeah. sort of traditional. Mm, no, I think mm, that's what it's part but of. The, this is, yeah, but it's just, it, there is a, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a, a minor, it might seem like a minor difference, but I think it's a very important one. You're talking about matriarchy and, and replacing men. I think your point, Martin, is the crucial one in a way. It's actually good old-fashioned cultural Marxism, mm. which is attempting basically to get rid of the family, which mm. Marx identified as being the very bedrock of capitalism. Mm. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, I think it is. And yeah. if you replace the family with something else, which might be the socialist superstate, Mm. Or, you know, that, that I think is, is the long term dream. Mm. The dependency on the family is, is outmoded. The dependency on Crown is outmoded. Let's be dependent on the state. And the state politics that drives this is that cultural Marxism. It's the backbone of modern socialism. Every time this comes to the electoral booze, it's annihilated by the electorate. Mm. Yet mm. it stubbornly persists in our media, in our whole corridors of power, and in academia. The public don't want it. You know, the work that we did together, John, you know, shows that traditional values still work for men. They'd like to work hard. Mm. They'd like to provide. All these things that we're told are toxic actually brings them great well-being, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we, we did a couple of studies, one in the UK, one in the States, a uh, survey of 7,000 men in total, and we found that the, the best predictor of, of men's mental well-being was um, uh, how much job satisfaction they experienced yeah. mm -hmm. and whether they had relationship stability or not. So so basically, ha a happy man is a guy who's he's working in a job that he, he enjoys, he's probably working very hard, and he's also got a stable relationship. This, it doesn't seem toxic at all. We also found that the, the types of, of uh, values that they ascribe to were, uh, were all very laudable. They, they want to be dependable, they, they value being honest. I mean, they, they was, they're just far from, from being uh, a kind of toxic bunch of tearaways. I mean, we were just finding that these, these guys are really just, you know, if anything, you know, I, I wish, you know, I'm aspiring to be yeah. as good as uh, a lot and, of and it's bad for It's bad for women too, because it reinforces the idea of, of, of women basically being repressed and being infantilized mm -hmm. yeah. and being unable to mm -hmm. do anything on their own and that they'll never be able to escape the shackles. But there's a wider issue here too because Western society is now at its weakest point in 250 years and just at this point masculinity is having a state of crisis and the traditional masculinity that brought the Western world so much success is now at its nadir just at the time when we're seeing the Western world in, in, in snared and encircled by you know the, the jackals and hyenas of China and ISIS and others who are extremely alpha, ma alpha male type masculines if you want and we need to project uh, masculinity strong enough to deter them, as opposed to this current limp, impotent-looking sort of state that we are in now. Well, there's a backlash coming, I think, a positive backlash. I really do. But I, th I, really I, I think a lot of what we what we see in society is actually to do with the absence of masculinity. I mean, if you look at if you look at things like victim culture or the whole idea of safe spaces or the whole idea of being offended, anti competition, these are all the whole opposition mm. to competition. What we've actually mm. got in society at the moment is a real lack of masculinity, which affects women as well. You know, I think that that ma you know we should see masculinity as a resource that I is available mm. to women. You know, where. I was thinking a practical example, you know, when I was young, if I, I remember, you know, once getting slightly harassed and my response was, was to thump the chap. <laughs> and, um, you know, whereas now a, 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 a young woman would, would go crying somewhere, you know, so this is a, you know, well, we I this a masculine approach, you know, now yes. we, women, women have lost masculinity, unfortunately. Don't, don't we see this in a way with the Me Too thing? Yes. I, the, I remember, you know, the older women say, well, why can't you just like, slap around the fact it's something like this? I mean, it's not to, yeah. not to be true. No, about not, this, but, no. but, but it is absolutely true. For example, um, when we extend this into things like wolf whistling, mm -hmm. you know, wolf whistling is always in the news cycle and there's a huge generational split. Joanna Lumley said, you know, I like being wolf whistled. 
and there's a huge kind of co- you know, crossover of mm. elderly people that well actually it's quite nice maybe they miss it <laughs> <laughs> maybe they miss getting you yes. know, compliments in the street whereas um, the, the woke generation are now straight onto everyday sexism straight outright sexual harassment and it's sort of ne- never the twain shall meet and so do we have a position where every sort of gendered interaction is now being examined and projected onto social media and this causes trepidation and uncertainty and so we're seeing a great deal of men retreating mm. into caves you know psychological caves metaphorical caves real caves pornography video games social isolation and actually that's the cause that's causing more problems yeah. because they're becoming removed and they feel worthless they feel despised they feel hated by society because they're imbibed in this culture now nobody wins mm. if these young men are growing up feeling like that nobody it's, it, it is actually it's very worrying when you see the way in which social relations now and personal relations are sort of monitored, aren't they? They're, they've been, it's almost like, it's so overused, but you know, 1984, where people are too frightened actually to interact at work We're or seeing talk. That. We're seeing well, that and there's a very good reason for this. I mean, Jordan Peterson says that men actually don't feel often equipped to argue with women on these very points because there's a point at which if two chaps have an argument, they maybe go outside, have a, have, have a fist fight or something. You know, there's always that's as the last resort sort of a thing. Um, whereas you would never think of doing that with a woman in that dynamic. And so suddenly you have a situation whereby if you have an argument, you're then seen to be a bully if you win, but if you've lost, you're pathetic. Mm. And there's no, you know, whereas with, between men, it's often shown that men can have an argument, yeah. they may have fisticuffs, yeah. and they're friends again by the end of the day. Yeah. It's a very yeah. different dynamic psych- right. psychologically in terms of how people engage with each other, and men don't feel equipped mm. to actually, they don't know what the rules are for mm. arguing with, with women. Mm. Mm. It's interesting, we've done a lot of talking about banter in the past, haven't we, and the importance of banter in very masculine environments, such as you know, the front line or coal mines, you know, where people's lives are dependent on each other. You know, men test each other in a way that will be considered, you know, a hate crime you know, by the language we use. And, you know, it's quite it, on the surface, if you look at it, write it on paper, it looks abusive. But actually men do interact in different mm. ways. Mm. And a healthy way, you're testing boundaries. Do I trust this person? Can they take a joke? They can. I'll, I'll, I'll allow them more into my lives. It can mm. be useful. But all of that interaction now has been framed as damaging and toxic. And I think we're throwing the baby out of the bathwater. If, if you look at the sort of biological anthropology of all of this, what you actually find is that in many ways, men are much more sociable than women. They actually have a tendency to create large groups. They function in close quarters, in armies, and they all manage to get on with each other. Actually, men, in many ways, you could argue they've got stronger social skills than women, just in sort of their group formation. And also you find they, that there is this ability to argue argue and then make friends again and uh, it's sort of if, it's, if, if you look at evolutionary anthropology you can also see it sort of in the animal kingdom you'll actually I mean I don't want to compare but you know uh, you'll actually find that male chimpanzees cooperate far more together and groom each other much more than female chimpanzees and I think we need to start recognizing the sort of real qualities of masculinity of which you know sociability and risk-taking and also sensitivity if you look at um, th- there is evidence to suggest that actually Actually, if you look at you know male and female babies, it's the male babies that are more sensitive than the girl babies. I know I was. Yes. Well, well I, th- I, th- I, th- I, th- I think that is. I think yeah. I think we've got to call a day here. What's, what's actually saying? We, we've been talking this conversation now, and this makeup would no longer be allowed on the BBC. I think. No. Wouldn't would it? It no, wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't tick diversity boxes, and you know, I, I think that in itself is. Know, an absolute rot. Mm. You know, I have no problem with women leading. I have no problem with, with women leading the country, women leading business, so long as they're the best person for the job. Yeah. Meritocracy. But we are now in, in a phase of every single thing has to tick a box on a diversity sheet, apart from diversity of thought, where are the Brexiteers at the BBC, for example, where are the Conservatives in academia. You know, diversity isn't just about how we look or what's in our trousers, mm. it's about mm. what's between our ears. And I think yep. we're losing sight of that. Thank you very, very much. It's a great conversation. Well, one, one just more wanted to say, because I, being a bit of a geek, I went through every single episode of Politics Live since they launched, yeah. and on no occasion was there an, an all-male panel. Yeah. Um, there have been all-female pa- panels on around five, six, seven, eight mm. occasions, mm. and there have been panels which have been majority f- f- female mm. on many occasions. The, the reverse has never been the, 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 the case. Sexist monster for even bothering <laughs> to check that. <laughs> I'll tweet at the page for anyone to check. <laughs> 
All right. Look, thank you very, very much to, to, to all of you today. Um, please do uh, subscribe to the new show, won't you? And, and also, do we love your comments. You know, hundreds of them come in. And I, I think we've raised a hell of a lot of points today. So I expect, uh, I hope, a great deal of engagement uh, with you. Okay, so see you next time. Thank you very much.